Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you to the first session of the second fabulous day of a really fabulous symposium. The topic this morning is promoting and consuming the Wild West. It looks like we've got three exceptionally interesting papers. I'll introduce the speakers one by one as they come up to speak, but has, as has been practiced, we'll keep the question period to the end. First then, I'm very happy to introduce James or Jim Connolly. James Connolly is George and Francis Ball Distinguished Professor of History at Ball State University. He's the author of several books, including An Elusive Unity, Urban Democracy and Machine Politics in Industrial America, and What Middletown Read, Print Culture in an American Small City. Very interesting. His title this morning is the Wild West in the American Heartland. Jim. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, it's always nice to talk to the Early Risers Club. Uh, so. Uh, I, I'm still trying to get the picture of Jeremy, Doug, and Frank in a hotel room out of my head. So uh, um, <coughs> uh, it may take me a few minutes to get going here. Um, <laughs> uh, I do want to thank uh, Jeremy, Doug, and Frank for putting this together. I work with Doug, and there's been more than one occasion when I've been in the room when they've been having a video conference. So I've heard how much work they've put into uh, preparing this, and I appreciate uh, being included. Uh, thanks as well to the center staff for putting this on. I, I know it's a it's a lot of work, uh, and a, lot, a lot's been going on for quite a while, uh, so I appreciate being part of it. Uh, I have to confess I'm a bit of an interloper here, as you heard perhaps from the introduction. Uh, I, I'm not a historian of the American West or of, uh, of Buffalo Bill. I'm a historian of the American East and Midwest. I study mostly the industrializing part of the United States in the 19th uh, and early 20th century. Um, so what I hope I can do today, at least, is bring a, a, a little bit of a fresh perspective, or at least a different perspective on uh, the Wild West. Uh, and I want to do that uh, in part by essentially you know, flipping the, uh, the microscope around and looking at things from the wrong end. And of course, when you do that, the thing you're, you're looking at seems quite distant compared to your uh, immediate surroundings. It looks further away. It looks a little bit, uh, a little bit different, uh, perhaps. Uh, and one other thing before I uh, delve into this, I did want to note, you see the names listed at the bottom of the slide here. These are all students who uh, contributed to the project I'm going to talk about uh, this morning. And so I wanted to note them and also to thank uh, the center since uh, it was funding from the Center of the West that helped uh, employ uh, some of these students. So um, that was uh, much appreciated. Um, so the, the project that, that we're working on uh, examines the reception uh, an, of the Wild West and the experience uh, that visitors to the Wild West performances had uh, in the industrial part of the United States. And what you see here is a heat map of all the Wild West performances uh, that took place in the United States. And so you see the dark red area is the place uh, where most of the performances were concentrated. Uh, and <coughs> Uh, this isn't altogether surprising. This is the most populated part of the country. This is where the, the paying audience was. So it's not surprising that most of the performances of the Wild West took place in this, this belt. This is also the section of the United States that industrialized in the 19th century uh, that uh, was growing in terms of population quite rapidly. Uh, so although none of this is surprising, it does underscore the fact uh, that uh, the, the Wild West is, in the United States at least, uh, in many ways, a presentation of the West, a stylized presentation of the West, uh, to uh, residents of communities that were industrialized or uh, were in the midst of industrializing. So what we're doing at, at Ball State is putting together a project examining the experience and reception of the Wild West in this region of the country and especially in the Midwest. We want to look at Ohio and Indiana, Michigan, uh, Illinois, uh, and other parts of the Midwest. So what I have this morning is kind of a preliminary report based on uh, the work we've done in Indiana. Uh, and we've uh, gathered uh, press coverage of the Wild West between 1895 and 1908, uh, a, a period of time in which uh, the exhibition visited 25 cities in Indiana. And we've, we've been able to collect thus far 572 uh, articles from newspapers uh, that represented local commentary uh, on uh, 
the exhibition, its coming, uh, and the experience of it. <coughs> now, um, before I get into the press coverage, I wanted to briefly touch on uh, some samples of individual responses uh, to the experience uh, of, of the Wild West. Uh, Ball State is in Muncie, Indiana, and in our university archives, we have three diaries that record individual responses to a performance. Um, <coughs> uh, this is a performance that took place in Muncie on August 4th, 1899, uh, and this was the first time that the Wild West had been in the city since 1886. And so, of course, in the intervening years, it had gone off to Europe, it had uh, spent the better part of a year in Chicago, uh, and it attracted a great deal of attention. Uh, and so the first of the diarists who record an impression of uh, the Wild West is Jenny Neely. She's 63 years old. She's a single woman. She lives with her elderly father. She actually recorded her impressions in her father's diary. He'd been keeping it for many years, but uh, at the very end of his life, she began making entries. Uh, and so she notes, as you can see here, uh, that the Wild West drew a, a large number of people into town. Uh, she points out that the tent is really big, which I kind of read as a proxy for the her impression of the scale of the show, the size of the show. And she notes that it rained uh, pretty heavily uh, that day. Um, our second diarist uh, is Nora Hawk. She's 21, uh, single, the daughter of, of a carriage maker. Uh, and she too takes note of the large crowds that are drawn into the city, including some family friends who come into town uh, and attend the show with her. Uh, you'll note that she refers to the uh, the show is a circus, uh, and that's a point I want to come back to uh, in, a, in a few minutes. And, and you can see as well that the rain was a big deal. Uh, this was an important part of, uh, of this experience that day. Those of you, we have a few of us here I know are from Indiana. It can rain really hard in the summer, uh, in the afternoon. Uh, and so uh, it's not hard for us to picture uh, the scene here. Uh, our third diarist uh, is um <coughs> Frederick Putnam. He's 81. Uh, he moved to Muncie, Indiana in the 1840s and began keeping a diary in 1846 uh, and continued on all the way up through 1899 and for a couple years more uh, after that. He notes in a kind of characteristically grumpy way that the city's not just crowded but overcrowded. Um, and perhaps most interesting is he connects Buffalo Bill with Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, uh, and this makes sense. In 1899, one of the key features of the show is the, the charge up San Juan Hill. Uh, that's reenacted, uh, and um, <coughs> uh, it's featured quite heavily in the advertisements uh, as the show's uh, coming into town. Uh, and this is as close as we get in a diary to anyone making any reference to the political or the ideological significance uh, of the Wild West or the story of civilization that, uh, that it presents. Um, uh, and that's an interesting uh, thing to note, and I want to talk a bit more about that in a moment, but I, I first want to point out that even though the commentary here seems relatively mundane, it's about crowds and rain and things like that, it is significant that in the only three diaries we have for this moment in time in this place, all three of them make reference to the Wild West. Even Putnam, who we don't think went to any of the performances. Uh, and so this is alone suggests that this is a significant event uh, in the life uh, of the community. Um, that said, it's a little surprising to me that there wasn't more that made of the story of civilization that's presented in this, uh, in the Wild West, in this, in this exhibition. Um, <coughs> uh, there are scholars who write about the Midwest who make the argument that the whole story of the frontier is really a Midwestern invention. Frederick Jackson Turner's account of the, of the frontier uh, was the product of, they argue, a Midwestern imagination because it was the Midwest before the Far West that experienced the process of taming the wilderness and establishing communities and developing a civilization uh, they were simply further along in this story uh, than the West was uh, at the end of the 19th century. Uh, and so if you look at uh, the histories that are written of counties in Indiana and other parts of the Midwest in this period, and this is kind of a cottage industry of producing these uh, locally oriented histories of individual counties. Basically every one of the 94 counties in Indiana has one or more of these volumes that was produced uh, in this period. And if you survey the language in them, you find abundant references to pioneers and settlers and the wilderness and the frontier uh, and so forth. Uh, so there's kind of an expectation that when a show presenting uh, this narrative shows up in town that people will take note of that. Uh, but we don't see in the diary commentary any kind of references to the substance of the show. Um, and in some ways we don't see as much as you might expect uh, in the press coverage that took place. Some of this may be the result of the fact that this story was entirely familiar uh, to these people. Uh, if you look at the print culture of this period, an area that I've been working on, and in this region of the country, what you find is 
that the stories of the West are all over the place. Uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Wayne Wiegand, a library historian, um, has written a book called um, uh, The Main Street Public Library, and it profiles the um, library histories of these five towns you see, so maybe you see some of them are cut off, it's Osage, Iowa, uh, I have to turn around because I can't read my little screen here, uh, <laughs> Lexington, Michigan, Sauk Center, Minnesota, uh, Morris, Illinois, and Rhinelander, Wisconsin. And so in each of these town libraries you had uh, collections and, and Wayne put together the catalogs and what he found is that stories of the West, stories of dime novelists like Edward Ellis who you see here, Seth Jones, one of the early Western stories, um, uh, or Horatio Alger who wrote stories about the West as well as about street urchins in New York City. Uh, they are abundantly represented uh, in, these, in these collections. Uh, uh, Wister's The Virginian that we heard a little bit about yesterday, uh, in Osage, Iowa, they purchased 27 copies between 1901 and 1950. So it was an extremely popular book that obviously got uh, a great deal of use. Uh, in some of the work I've done, we've been able to figure out that people actually read these stories. Uh, we worked in a project where we assembled uh, in, um, <coughs> in a database the circulation records of the Muncie Indiana Public Library, the home of these diarists. And what you see here is some of the top most circulated Western stories. And at the very top is Alger's story of the young adventurer, a boy going west. This was the second most widely borrowed book uh, in our collection. You see Edward Ellis, a dime novelist who wrote many Western stories. He was the fourth most popular uh, author in our collection, um, <coughs> or in our database. Charles King, friend of Buffalo Bill, wrote about his, uh, his early life, his encounter with uh, yellow hair, uh, his, um, <coughs> um, uh, he, he wrote the screenplay for a silent film uh, later on in, in, in Cody's life. Uh, he's, the, he's a highly popular uh, uh, author as well. Uh, Owen Wister's The Virginian just barely makes it in. They purchase a copy in August of 1902, and our data ends in December of 1902. But in that time, the book was borrowed every week. Uh, and this, um, and the, um, the library decided to purchase a second copy right away because they realized how popular it was. So I'm sure if our data carried on further, we'd see that he was one of the most popular uh, writers in the collection. So, uh, so I want to turn for a, a, a few minutes now to uh, looking at some of the press coverage, these uh, newspaper articles uh, that we've been collecting, uh, presenting various aspects of uh, the Indiana response to um, uh, the Wild West performances. Um, we collected 572 articles, as I said. Uh, we did not include advertisements, but we did include uh, copy that was clearly written uh, with the help of Buffalo Bill's promotional people, Major Burke, whom we'll hear about in a few minutes, and others, uh, who uh, obviously sat down with the, the editors of papers and, and gave them copy or helped them uh, craft some of these articles, because they're, they're sometimes quite similar, but there are distinctions that you can see from one paper to the next, uh, from one article to the next. It's not simply uh, transcribing what was provided uh, by, um, uh, by promoters. Uh, and so one of the f other things we did is we separate the, the material into commentary that was presented before the show, announcing it's coming, uh, and commentary or responses to the show that were essentially reviews of what happened, uh, what, what took place in the performance. Uh, and so on the left side you see here a representation of some of the main uh, vocabulary of the pre-show commentaries, the pre-performance commentaries, and on the right you see the commentary afterwards. Uh, and one thing I want to point out as we looked at this uh, was that beforehand uh, it was usually about uh, as common to refer to the Wild West as an exhibition as it was to call it a show. Uh, and of course the exhibition is the word that uh, Buffalo Bill and his group preferred because it would emphasize the realism, the educational value of uh, the performances. But when you look at the, uh, the coverage afterwards, it's a show. And that's a subtle change in the language, but it's one that reflects the awareness, I think, of this audience that they're watching uh, a, a representation, a stylized presentation of the West that, that it, it's not just purely real, uh, not, not just purely realistic. Uh, if you drill down into the language, you find lots of references to education and educational uh, <coughs> uh, value in the show. Only two times in the post-show commentary does the word education or educational uh, appear uh, in any of this. Um, we also did a little bit of topic modeling where we looked for clusters of language that appeared uh, in this coverage. Uh, and beforehand, we tend to see clusters that talked about the, the elements of the show. So there's a, a cluster around battles and Americans and, uh, and the world, or around um, Indians, Arabs, and Boers. So you can see some of the uh, various aspects of the show appearing in, 
uh, in this language. When we look at the same clusters afterwards, it's about the street and people and a parade and afternoon and things like that. So it's more about narrating the event in the community rather than uh, within uh, the arena. Uh, and so this, this distinction all sort of suggests that um, the response to the show was as much about uh, its, its role as an event in the community as it was about the particular set of messages, the ideological ideas that are being uh, presented here. Uh, so if we, if we look at a few examples of the kinds of, uh, of coverage uh, that we're talking about here, uh, and I know I'm throwing a lot of text at you here uh, in this image, but we s I've, I've selected three uh, articles from Fort Wayne, Indiana newspapers uh, that comment on uh, the Wild West. The first of these is an article that appeared in advance of a Wild West performance in 1896. Um, <clears throat> and this is one of those collaborations between the promoters and the editors, and you can sort of see the promotional material really informing the way that the, the writer, this local writer, puts together um, <coughs> uh, this, this, um, uh, this article. Uh, and you can see the references to the pioneers of civilization uh, and pushing across the West through the dangers and so forth. Um <coughs> um, and so this is the, the sort of the way that the show is being presented to the public. Come see it for these reasons. This is what the promoters want you to uh, come to the show uh, to see and to understand uh, with all this. And you'll note late in the text here, there's a reference to the fact that Buffalo Bill uh, is a halo of romance, there's a reference to this halo of romance. So there's a little bit of a knowing wink that, yeah, we know this is a kind of somewhat fictionalized, somewhat romanticized presentation, but it's still real, it's still educational, it still captures a, 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 a fading uh, set of experiences um, along this way. So here's another Fort Wayne article uh, from 1907, which, which is a commentary af on, the, on the post show. There is in this and other articles some discussion of the substance of what's taking place uh, on the arena floor, uh, but there's, there's plenty of stuff now about logistics, uh, about um, the, the nature of the event uh, within the community, the fact that this is, this is a, a significant happening uh, in the town. Uh, one of the interesting things we found as we look for language in the post-show commentary, the word civilization never appears. It's there at the, in the promotion, it's never there uh, in the commentary afterwards. They're not latching on to that narrative uh, in ways that, um, that we might have expected. Uh, you'll note as well, uh, and I highlighted it, um, they refer to uh, the Wild West as, the, um, as a circus. Uh, and this is another sort of interesting note. You recall that Nora Hawk as well uh, called uh, the performance uh, a circus. Uh, and this reminds us that there's a context for these performances that, that Buffalo Bill's Wild West is, is operating within. Um, it's associated with circuses, even though it's attempting not to do that. It, it, a lot of the promotional material, they talk about the fact that it's not an ordinary circus. It's it has educational value. It's real. Uh, and so there's a, there are great pains to distinguish themselves from circuses, but I don't think they were entirely successful in doing that in the minds of the audiences in these Midwestern uh, towns. Um, <coughs> so in many ways, the Wild West performance was a big, unique, and special event, but it was part of uh, a set of events, a set of experiences that were relatively uh, common. The circus comes to town. You can see some, some itineraries of a few circuses uh, pretty regularly in these Indiana communities, uh, these mid-sized cities and towns uh, around the country. And they come, as does Buffalo Bill's Wild West, through the railroad network that you see represented on the right here. And Indiana is very densely um, populated, in effect, by railroad lines. And it's at the intersections of these lines where several lines come together. Those are the cities where these performances are taking place uh, in all of this. Um, and these railroad lines were really channels of, of economic and of cultural exchange uh, through the circuses, through the Wild West, through stage performances as well. Uh, the, the connective tissue between these communities is the railroad system in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, so Buffalo Bill's Wild West is experienced in the context of these kinds of events uh, in, in, in these communities. Uh, uh, and it's a process that is reinforcing the sense of these, these cities and towns that they are now part of civilization. They are part of uh, this network of communities that stretches beyond uh, Indiana, beyond the Midwest, off to New York or to Chicago or to the West Coast, or excuse me, to, the, to Europe. We're not going to the West Coast yet, sorry. Um, <coughs> um, and that their connections to the wider world, these cultural connections, ran through these channels. And you have to remember, these communities are quite anxious to show themselves as part of modern civilization. They are now integrated into 
uh, this, this larger network, this larger set of experiences. And so one of the things, uh, and Joe and I were talking about this last night a little bit, one of the things you see quite constantly, and this is something that promoters emphasize and that local editors are quite happy to stress, uh, is the fact that what they're getting in uh, Terre Haute, Indiana, or in Muncie, Indiana, or in Kokomo, Indiana, what they're getting is the same thing that the folks in Chicago got or the same things that the people in London got. And they're assured that what, what was going on in Europe is now going on here. And this is another way of, of reminding themselves that, hey, we're now part of the fully developed world. We're part of the mainstream society. The wilderness is out west where Buffalo Bill is, out in Wyoming and Montana and places like that uh, with this. Uh, and so um, these newspaper reports uh, <coughs> um, uh, love to stress this, love to stress the fact that, hey, this is more evidence that we are now a plugged in, well-connected community that's part of uh, this developed, urbanized, even cosmopolitan uh, world. Uh, and so the performance provides evidence of that, not just in terms of its substance, but also just in terms of its presence as part of this network of, of, of cultural integration uh, that's developed uh, around railroads in late 19th, 19th and early 20th century America. The other thing you see is uh, lots of commentary in the little towns that aren't quite uh, in the, these networks uh, that talk about how so-and-so and so-and-so went off to to South Bend to see the performance. And this is sort of cementing uh, this sort of urban hierarchy that now exists in, in these places where you have sort of these central communities at these railroad intersections and you have the smaller towns and it's the, the role of these central communities, the Muncie's, the South Bend's, the Indianapolis's uh, of the Midwest to be the connective tissue between the agrarian parts of the Midwest uh, and the centers of culture and civilization such as New York or Chicago uh, or London. Uh, in Paris. So the presence of the Wild West uh, in a community was a big event. I don't mean to suggest otherwise, um, but it was not an unfamiliar event. It was part of a larger set of events uh, that was reinforcing this sense of connection between uh, uh, individual communities in the wider world at a point in time when these cities and towns were quite anxious to grow and to demonstrate uh, this, this set of connections. Uh, and so I just want to close uh, with, with one more note from a diarist. Uh, and one more reminder that no matter how important uh, the Wild West may seem to all of us, for some people, the big deal on the day of the show is that it rained. So, uh, so thanks very much.